It works. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church today on this beautiful day. And welcome everybody at home that's joining us from Zoom from the many congregations that we have out there. Gosh, it's a wonderful day to come and serve the Lord and participate. Oh, Jim's speaking today. Don't Can't get much better than that, can it? Huh? And welcome, 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 welcome. Um, any uh, behavioral bingo and during any behavioral? Oh, we have one. Yeah. All right. All right. Anybody out on Zoom? All right. Hey, we're back in the groove. It's good. Thank you, Sherry. Putting us back in the groove. Uh, don't forget that they are yep. out there on the table, and you can also uh, get them online on our website. So by all means, print one down, stick it on your refrigerator, and play the game. Um, next Sunday is Communion Sunday, so put that on your calendar. Make sure you, if you need to go out and buy some juice or whatever and some bread, be prepared for next Sunday because that's an important, very important day. Uh, Thursday, February 8th, uh, on Zoom at 7 p.m. I'm gonna hold a priesthood meeting, so please join. Next Sunday, put that on your calendar. Uh, don't forget, we do collect food donations back in the foyer, uh, and then Misty, make sure that those donations get to the food bank that the University, University Methodist Church does. Uh, we help them out in that regard. Uh, potluck, February 11th, following the worship service. So bring all your food. We love to eat and we love to chat. So it's a good time. Uh, Bible class is Monday, 7 p.m. And spiritual exploration is on Tuesday at 6.30 you can join either or you can join both because they're on separate nights. So, uh, you know, those are available. And again, it's the Zoom link that we have on our website that people use to join our, our services on Sundays. Uh, next Crafty Ladies meeting is Tuesday, February 13th, 10 a.m. here at the church, first classroom as you go down the hallway. So, Anybody would like to join that group, please do. They would love to have you join the group. Uh, game day. Well, actually, before game day, it is on the same day, we do a church spruce up at 1 o'clock. You know, we come in, run the vacuum cleaner, check the bathrooms, those kind of things. And then at the end of the month, we have the cleaning people come in and and clean the church in a more major manner. But we do it, we call it a spruce up time, one o'clock. Um, and that is on the 17th of February. So please put that on your calendar. And then immediately when we're finished sprucing at two o'clock, uh, we get into game day. And we do have a good time. Edna's very competitive. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Velma's pretty competitive. So please join us. It is a good time. Bring a game you'd like for us. We learned a new one the last uh, the last game day. Never played it before. And, and it had to do with rednecks, and I won. I don't know if that's good or bad, but, um, but it was fun. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the women's retreat. There are um, registration forms in the back, but Patty puts the link in the announcement slides and in the bulletin that she sends out electronically. But you can either way, uh, the 15th, I think you have to register before, you know, if you want to go. So ladies, uh, don't forget that. That is on the 23rd and 20, through the 25th of February. And with that, we have a lot of prayer concerns today. We do. And Misty, I'm going to invite her up to uh, bring those to us right now.
Will you please bow with me as we ask for prayers for our loved ones and our friends? Dear Lord, we are holding up our loved ones and dear friends who are in need of your comfort and spirit at this time. We ask that you be with Louisa L., who has been diagnosed with cancer. Marilyn M., who fell and injured her hand and is also having heart issues. And we also ask continue, we ask you, also ask to continue to hold Abby B., who is dealing with multiple injuries from a car accident. We ask for healing prayers for them and comfort for their families and doctors as they continue to care for them. We also ask for healing prayers for Scott J., who is dealing with back pain, and Kim J., who is having a tooth extraction and health. Liz T. for other medical issues. May your healing power be upon them. We also ask for comforting prayers for Sue W. and Mark L., who are both have now been put on hospice care. May you be with their families as they go through the hard time of saying goodbye to their loved ones. Be with the Stinson and Purdy family as they lay to rest their father, Mike S. May you com continue to comfort them and give them peace of mind, knowing he is now with you and out of pain. We also ask to uphold Ralph W. as he is struggling with the stressful situation. May you find the comfort and peace knowing that you will keep with, be with him in every step that he takes. And we also continue to hold up the Torres Gray family that their situation will soon be resolved and the healing can start for them. We ask you these prayers in your son's most holy name. Amen. Before we get started this morning, we have a tradition in this church. And when somebody's birthday falls on the Sunday, you know, we're going, we, we sing happy birthday. And those out on Zoom, you can sing right along with us. So let's sing happy birthday to Carol Birdie. Yay! Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, 
Happy birthday, dear Carol. Happy birthday to you and many more. Yay! Well, let's start this morning and remain seated by joining in and singing the Breath of the Living God, hymn number 43. Well, welcome to the Shenandoah Congregation of the Community of Christ Church. I'm uh, Earl, a pastor here, and I'm not saying that from those in the, it's those out there that may join on Zoom. Uh, and we have a lot of folks participating this, more, this morning in the service. We have Jim, who's delivering our message. We have Misty, who is our greeter this morning uh, and involved in our little drama in the call to worship. We also have Kelly Payton, Jeremy Bowles, Jenna Bowles, and Richard Cole participating in our call to worship, along with Edna, who has a non-speaking part, but I've already forewarned her not to get her feelings hurt when the time comes. Um, then we have Carol, or Cheryl, your Carol's birthday, gonna run my mind. We have Cheryl, who is uh, gonna give us our disciples' generous response, and Jenna is double duty today as well. She's gonna bring us our prayer to peace. So welcome everybody. I am so glad to be here. Um, so let's get right into the call of worship and go for it. You want power? I'll give you power. Hey, you can't give power away. Not like that. I'm the person that's a leader. That person isn't a leader. Everybody knows that. I'm in charge here. Here. Here's somebody who will work for you for next to nothing. I can get you anybody. Got a lottery ticket for sale here worth $325 million. Yours for a measly $200. 
If you have ever wanted to be famous, I'm the guy for you. All you need to do, come to me, sign this little contract here and give me your credit card number. Very minor steps that you need to take. But if you do that, we're all set. Now, after you finish those steps, just like Raymond, everybody will love you. Okay, guys. All right. Enough's enough. Have a seat. Sit down. Oh, my goodness. Of course, none of you have ever had these type of feelings yourselves run through your head. Or the pressures that people like these five, poor Edna, I can't believe she sat there and took that from Misty. You know, we get bombarded with this stuff. We do get bombarded with this stuff. You know, we worship many idols. And here's a list of many of those different idols we may not recognize power oh i heard that in there uh status oh, i heard that in there money types of food i didn't hear that one in there but wait till potluck and then you know uh the clothes that we wear and yeah, we don't have a problem with that so you know there's so many things out there but what is our priority, those things, or worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just ponder that just for a moment. With that, I would like you to join me again in singing our opening hymn, God, We Gather as Your People, hymn number 274, led by the Cold Choir. And please stand and remain standing through the benediction. Here 
Dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to join today, both here in this sanctuary, in all of our sanctuaries and our various homes and locations, wherever we are. Lord, we ask that, uh, well, we know this, that the Holy Spirit is here with us, and we ask that the Holy Spirit will be with Jim this morning as he brings us our message. Or Lord, we're here because we raise our voices to you and we know that you are the one and only God. For this, we are grateful for and pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior, amen. Please be seated. Our theme today is there is one God. And I'm sure there's nobody here that questions that. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit make up the Godhead. The Godhead. And uh, that there's one God. Um, in the reflection and sharing portion of the service, I'm going to share uh, a, an article from Bruce Crockett. And it's discernment, the practice of listening. The practice of listening. You know, there is a big difference between listening and hearing. One is you have to suspend all your personal thoughts and things to open up your mind to listen what others are telling you or communicating to you. Hearing, we're already outlining our next attack or our next judgment. Big difference between listening and hearing. One opens the mind, one closes the mind. And sometimes we need to think about it. So let's see what Bruce has to say. One of the major components of discernment is listening as described in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 162, 1B. Listen to the voice that echoes across eons of time and yet speaks anew in this moment. In order to listen, we must take time out to be quiet. And in the quiet, we are challenged to know or discern which interior voice is the voice of the divine. For there are many voices that go on inside us. There is the voice of distraction that tells us we need to answer our cell phone whenever it rings and vibrates. Nobody does that. 
There is the voice of distraction that encourages us to read an email the moment it arrives and answer it. Or be on Facebook or Twitter or text a message to a friend. Now, we don't do that. We have an impulse that doesn't want us to miss the next episode of a TV program. We definitely don't do that. We are kind of an anxious people. We are kind of an anxious people with our electronic devices all demanding our attention. Boy, it's a good thing we're not guilty of any of that stuff. But he goes on to say, and yet the psalmist writes, be still and know that I am God. In order to be still, we need to set those distractions to one side and sit in the quiet, calming ourselves from the gadget anxieties and sit with God. Oh, how difficult this is for so many. The other voices that may be heard in our heads are the voices of self-doubt, poor self-esteem, anger, judgment, and cynicism. These voices may be heard because we haven't internalized the fact that God loves us unconditionally and that God desires to commune with us daily even hourly, if we give God the time. Perhaps these voices would be softer if we practice forgiveness, participated in reconciliation, increased our patience and tolerance of others, and were not quick to judge. Each day, we are given the opportunity to sit quietly with God and be in his presence to speak and listen, to share and be affirmed, to lift our concerns and be comforted. This is where the listening part of discernment begins. So think of a time when you've heard the voices of self-doubt, poor self-esteem, anger, judgment, or injustice within you and your life. And those are things, that's something we probably need to think about more often. Or if you're like me and you're driving down the road and somebody does something and I hear this voice going through my mind, instead of reacting to it negatively, what should we do? Well, you need to keep your eyes on, but kind of slight your head and look up and say, Lord, help me. That's not easy to learn. But Bruce, the mess, the, the notes that Bruce has, has provided us, is really gives us a lot to think about. It's just uh, part of being human, but we can overcome it. So, The next hymn we're going to sing this morning is God of Wonder, God of Thunder. It's uh, hymn number uh, 18, led by the Cole, Cole Choir. And following, Jim, there's going to be the uh, scripture reading. And then Jim's going to give us, bring us our morning message. So uh, remain seated and let's sing this wonderful hymn. <clears throat>
1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are, are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, the weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed. But when you thus sin against brothers and sisters and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never again eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Good morning. Um, it's kind of a long scripture reading, but uh, I think it had a story uh, that we can learn from, and I didn't want to chop it up and lose some of that story. It's the last Sunday of this first month of the year, and uh, by the way, it's the birthday of someone's wife. Uh, I, I won't mention, but uh, Okay, I'll probably get in trouble for that. We know that. So, but I do greet you this morning. And uh, whether you're here or you're connected, uh, we are approaching the middle of winter in San Antonio. And the weather this time of year uh, might be anywhere from very cold uh, to reasonably pleasant. And uh, we get, uh, well, today we, we get this. And uh, that's not too bad. If you think it is, uh, just drive up 35 and go to Canada. It's uh, it's totally different there. So, uh, but truly, I do greet you uh, with with joy, and uh, you are my church family, and I love all of you. Our theme today is there is one God, and thinking about the scripture lesson in many ways, uh, Paul was sort of a circuit preacher. 
because he traveled a broad swath and cared for a series of different towns and cities. And because he was traveling, uh, he kept track with these cities through letters. And this series of, of uh, passages for the scripture lesson today was from Paul's letter to the city Corinth. And in the first part, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10 through 13, we heard that Paul was alerted uh, to some problems of dissent in Corinth. Uh, they weren't getting along. Um, of course, this never happens in, in our congregations. We know that. And, uh, and after the warning of dissent in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we encounter what the reason for the dissent was and the dissension uh, uh, that was causing Paul to worry about his congregation. And I'd like us to look into that a little bit. It turns out that Corinth was a very Romanized Greek city. The population was on both sides of very wealthy and very impoverished. And they were heavily polytheistic pagan. Uh, they believed in a lot of gods and pagans. They worshiped idols. And yet uh, they also had a substantial Christian population. The Christian population consisted of two factions. Uh, one faction were the Christians that were longtime uh, Christians of Jewish heritage, of longtime Jewish heritage. And the other faction were new converts. And so we can kind of call them legacy Christians and convert Christians. Uh, and they were all Christian, but the paths they took to uh, get to Corinth and be in Corinth were different paths. So in Corinth, the polytheists, the pagans, had idols all around town. And they offered meat sacrifices to these very gods, uh, the god of rain, the god of the wind, the god of the sunrise, the god of the sunset. You, you know what I'm talking about. And because the meat that was uh, offered to those idols was cheaper than other consumer options, many of the poorer people, including the poorer Christians, uh, would buy the, uh, the converted Christians, would buy the sacrificed meat and eat it. And somehow this seemed wrong to the legacy Christians, the people who came from to Christianity through legacy Jewish backgrounds thought that it was wrong because it had anything whatsoever to do with an idol and the idol was wrong. And the convert Christians thought, well, those idols are fake idols. They, they're, you know, they don't mean anything and they have no power, so they can't ruin this meat and we can eat. So the problem emerged that the convert Christians felt like it was okay to eat the idol meat. And this bothered the legacy Christians who thought that that de defiled their Christian beliefs. And this conflict caused issues within the Christian community. And it made, <clears throat> had a negative effect on the overall Christian message to Corinth, because a lot of pagans would listen to these Christians talking to them and say, why should I listen to them? They fight amongst themselves. It, so uh, it, it affected the uh, overall message. So this is where Paul's response uh, starts to this dissent starts to come into this letter. Paul listened to both sides and saw both sides. Now, Paul was a legacy Christian, uh, but Paul also was well-traveled and was more liberal than some of the legacy Christians. And the more he thought about it, uh, it, it bothered Paul that there was this fight. Paul was pastoring his various cities and did not want to see internal turmoil, and nor did he want to see uh, losses in the uh, in something that I will call community, uh, not just numbers, but community, uh, sort of like soul glue that 
held people together. Um, I've been there uh, right here in this room and uh, speaking for them without permission, uh, I'll say Richard has also been there and Earl's there right now. Uh, you see, every pastor that I've ever known has been there and it's painful to see and feel dissension in the congregation, the loss of community. Both sides of the debate felt that their position was right, was correct, and they felt that they were right. Well, if I feel like I'm right, that means that the other side must be, what, wrong. Oh, if I'm right, you're wrong. And uh, and that kind of, of inter-family fight, the right and wrong, this is where Paul saw the loss of soul glue the loss of community, uh, right versus wrong. Dissent hurt into Paul's very soul. Paul wept. Well, it doesn't say that in the Bible. I'm just interpreting that. Paul hated to see a debate like this that would cause a loss of community among his congregation. Paul hated to see that the debate was causing problems uh, sharing the Christian story, the Christian mission outreach in Corinth. And Paul really wanted to see the outreach mission of the church get back to working and working for the good. Well, I said I've been there myself, and um, and no pastor wants to see a loss of community. No pastor wants to see the mission of the church or mission effectiveness be degraded but it happens. It happens to congregations and sometimes whole denominations and families. It can happen even to families and no pastor wants to see it. A lack of community makes any pastor's heart ache and Paul's ache. I don't wanna get into specifics, but one characteristic that's almost always part of situations like this where there is a lost community is forming of sides or tribes where this I am right and you are wrong and uh, where community is threatened. Community might be weakened. It might vanish. Paul wished that the sides would overcome their differences. Uh, how very often I have wished the same thing it would soothe our souls to see those differences overcome. Uh, over my years in the church, there have been many times where there have been changes take place that have caused, uh, well, change almost always causes some amount of turmoil and uh, sometimes causes uh, problems with people's soul glue. When I was younger, there were things that were quite different than today, how often I wished uh, the same thing that, that we would see better soul glue and our souls be healthier and have more community. Taking sides and tribes means that we become separated. We lose community. Over my life, I've witnessed changes that have taken place, and some of them have done this, and some to a lesser degree, perhaps. So I want to look back at a few of those uh, and things that I'm sure are examples of what Paul was seeing in Corinth. It used to be that our church, our denomination, had a belief that we were the, the one true church, the only church and everybody else was all wrong. And they were sinners and they were gonna go to hell, not because they didn't go to church, but they went to the wrong church. And gradually though, we've adopted a more inclusive belief and we have ended up a little bit uh, more okay as a church. And even as this is still in progress, community has survived this changed relatively well. Um, in 1960, the church decided to accept baptisms of polygamists in India. This was a rough one 
and we lost a few members who were not able to accept this change. This one was harder on community because we did let more sides and tribes enter into how we handled this. Priesthood authority. Our denomination has had an evolving, I want to say a maturing definition of what is the term priesthood authority. Not all churches feel the same about priesthood authority. Uh, some feel like uh, priesthood is power, and some feel like priesthood is about ministry. And indeed, our church has moved towards the priesthood authority having to do with ministry, priesthood being ministers and ministry instead of power. And unlike hierarchical models, the uh, community of Christ emphasizes a more egalitarian or equalized uh, concept of priesthood. Priesthood is primarily understood as a calling to serve, a calling to servanthood, and not a license to wield power. And this has been a healthy evolution in my lifetime, and it's still taking place. It's not 100% yet, but it's still taking place, and it has been gradual. But community has survived this change. Uh, then there was this really big one, uh, perhaps the really big one, and um, you, some of you chuckle because you already know what I'm going to talk about, um, and it's about women being allowed to be in the priesthood. Our denomination really handled this like sides and tribes, and we were very, very separated. Indeed, uh, community was truly injured and community even to this day still suffers. It suffers at the denomination level, at, at uh, community congregation levels and in families. And we really, we really need to learn how to deal with change in ways that do not split us into sides and tribes or I'm right, you're wrong. We need to get over that and learn a way around it. When I was younger, it was common to hear sermons that held out uh, fear of hell. Um, but over the last 40 years, our denomination has matured and has moved toward being an inviting people to accept the kingdom, inviting people into the kingdom instead of trying to scare the hell out of people. Um, sorry for that abuse, but it it's uh, that's the way that's the way we tried to do it, and some uh, churches still, some denominations still do. But we organizationally try to emphasize the joy of the kingdom, and we proclaim Jesus Christ and promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. And that has been much a much better. Uh, approach in in reaching out to people. And I feel that this has been beneficial in supporting community. In the 1990s, we shifted our policies from practicing closed communion, where only members, baptized members, could take communion, to practice open communion. And this was a sea change, but it actually, in my opinion, was also beneficial in supporting community. And we did not so much take sides and tribes with this issue. We didn't get that I'm right, you're wrong with that issue. <clears throat> Pardon me. Around 2013, the church held national conferences uh, in several countries and several of these conferences set policies and procedures that began to clearly be accepting and supportive of full inclusion of LGBT people in the church, in its mission, and in its ministry. And while we did have some resistance, and we did in, in fact lose a few members, mostly the church handled this in a way that supported community and made us stronger, and we have become 
a stronger uh, church because of our uh, acceptance of, of inclusion of people. There are a few current things. And um, when I say current things, I mean things that aren't from the past, but are going on. Uh, these were things that I mentioned that I and we saw and experienced. But just because those stories were in the past does not mean that we are done. We still have issues that require us uh, to either support community or allow sides and tribes to take over. Scriptural authority. Uh, our church is in the midst of trying to uh, adapt to new ways of looking at scriptures. Uh, folks generally look at scriptures somewhere on a spectrum between totally literal to totally metaphorical. And the real truth is almost everyone falls somewhere in the middle on that spectrum, not totally literal and not totally metaphorical, but in the middle somewhere. And we need to accept that the spectrum in its entirety, all the spectrum and all the people that are on that spectrum are true believers. And we need to respect the entire spectrum, not just the people closest to where we are on that spectrum. One important point comes from the fact, I believe that we actually need both literal and metaphorical believers. We need both and we strengthen from both. Uh, but a recent, uh, and not but like, don't do that, do that, uh, but in a current, in, in a Addition, uh, there's a current Doctrine and Covenants uh, passage, uh, and it's uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 163, uh, paragraph 7, and parts of verses A, B, and C, and I'd like to share those with you, three points that come with how the church wants us to look at scripture today. The first is uh, scripture is an indispensable witness of the eternal source of light and truth. Eternal source of light and truth is God. And scripture is an indispensable witness to that eternal source, but is not that eternal source in and of itself. And it cannot be contained in any finite vessel or language. A finite vessel uh, does anybody know a finite vessel? Us. We're, we're humans. We are finite vessels. We cannot contain the entire witness of, of Scripture. And our language can't contain the entire uh, witness of Scripture. The next thing is that Scripture is not to be worshipped or idolized. That's important. Remember the idols that Paul was talking about and the, the idols where they sacrificed meat. Scriptures are not idols like that. They're to guide us and they're tools to help us. And then the third point, and this is very important. It is not pleasing to God when any passage of scripture is used to diminish or oppress races, genders, or classes of human beings. Much physical, emotional violence has been done to some of God's beloved children through the misuse of scripture. The church, our church, is called to confess and repent of such attitudes and practices. And I believe that that last sentence is meaning we are called to confess and repent of such attitudes and practices, even when it wasn't us that did it, when it's other people who have hurt some of God's uh, beloved uh, children. The scriptural behavior, this kind of scriptural behavior supports community. Another current thing, um, I'm going to say a phrase, <laughs> and you you can think. You don't have to raise your hand. Think if you've ever heard this phrase before. It's just a phrase from, from someplace, okay? 
thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Almost every Christian prays these words, yet very few actually take it seriously and consider it in actuality. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Some have thought that this refers to something, somehow refers to something after we die. But I believe that this refers to right here, right now, in reality. I think that this, this uh, refers to us alive. We would create this kingdom by our obedience and our kingdom building behavior. And this actually is a behavior that in itself becomes or is uh, very establishing of community. It is literally the community. The kingdom of God is truly the ultimate community. Another thing that I see change that's occurring or sensations that I see occurring uh, in people, it's my personal belief that God is smarter than me. And when I tell you with my limited knowledge and try to tell you that I know the only way you can be saved, I think I'm doing you a disservice. I do know a way you can be saved. And I think I even know another way you can be saved. But I'll lay down my life believing that God may know a hundred other ways that you have not heard that I have not heard uh, that God can save you because I'm convinced that God created every human being from day one to the end, every human being to be with God in eternity. That was the purpose of our creation. And I know a lot of sinners, myself included, but I don't know any sinner who's smarter than God and can outsmart God's infinite love. My sins can't outsmart God's infinite love. There is one God. There is one God, and that God loves you. God loves you in ways that you can only imagine. God loves you in ways that you can't necessarily express or that I can't express to you. There is one God, and you are invited to enter God's kingdom in this life and in eternity. There is one God, and I want to offer you an invitation. If you don't feel like you are part of the community, the soul glue, if you feel you lack the soul glue, come and take it. Get it. It's, it's yours for the asking. I want to sincerely and surely invite you that you make yourself part of God's community. Call it the church, call it the church family, call it whatever you might want to decide to call it. Take it, grasp it, it is yours. You may simply decide that this is your church family and that's fine. And you want to be in community and that's great. And you are accepted, wanted, and appreciate it, period, no conditions. You may decide to be baptized and make this your community that way, and that is fine. You are accepted, wanted, appreciated, but whoever, however you decide to join community, please do. This is what Paul was advocating for. This is what Paul was crying for, for all to be part and be invited to and become part of the community of God on earth. I invite you, I invite you all to follow Paul's recommendation and keep our various positions, beliefs, and practices politically, socially, philosophically. That's okay. Keep them. But let's do this without allowing tribal feelings and effects without allowing us uh, none of none of you are vermin and none of you are people who call people vermin we don't want to do that that's not our place in the world 
give those with different positions, beliefs, and practices all the same respect, tolerance, and acceptance that you would like them to give you. Give the tolerance and let the tolerance come to you too. Worship, always keeping community in our hearts and souls and proclaim Jesus Christ and promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. And misquoting Tiny Tim, God bless us all, everyone. Amen. Now, if you would, please um, well, yes, that's what I was looking for. Yes. Our hymn of transition, hymn number 70, God is here. And then once we finish this hymn, please remain seated. And then Jenna will bring us our prayer for peace, and Cheryl will bring us our disciples' generous response.
please join me in prayer. Spirit of loving community, thank you so much for the gift of community. Communities are powerful. Communities can band together in order to discern your word and create beautiful change. Communities can also reject those on the fringes, those who are different than we are, those who hurt us. Jesus was rejected by the very community that studied your word together. And yet he found a group to accept him and still included those who rejected him in his loving sacrifice. God, help us follow Jesus's example of peace. Before peace is healing, before healing is forgiveness, before forgiveness is a conversation at the table. May we form communities where folks from all walks of life with varied opinions and life experiences join together with the common goal of conversation that leads to healing, that leads to peace. We are so hopeful that our tables, big and small, boring and quirky, long-standing and young, can be the tables that bring the world to peace. We are not blind to the divisions and conflicts and abused power in our world. We see them, but as communities of faith, we, re we refuse to accept them. God, empower us to take our tables to the rejected, to bring healing, and to bring peace. In the name of Jesus, the most loving host. Amen. During this time of a disciple's generous response, we focus on aligning our heart with our one God's heart. Our offerings are more than meeting budgets or funding mission. We can tangibly express our gratitude to God through our offerings, who is the giver of all. As we share our mission ties, either by placing money in the plates or through e-tithing, use this time to thank God for the many gifts received in life. Our hearts grow aligned with God's when we gratefully receive and faithfully respond by living Christ's mission. Would you please join me in prayer now? Father, we thank you for our gifts, talents, and monies that you give to us to share with others. May these be multiplied as they are gathered from around the globe and arrive to the destination in a prompt manner. Amen. For our closing hymn this this morning, uh, I'd ask you all to stand and help us sing hymn number 650, Go My Children With My Blessing.
please bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come to a close of this service, Lord, we are grateful to be here today and listen to the message and to be with each other and to see each other on Zoom. Lord, we are blessed people. Lord, I ask that you go with us this day and those of us here in the sanctuary, get us home safely to wherever we're going. And those of us at home, uh, watch over them, be with them and on the things that they also do during the course of the week. Lord, we are a congregation that loves you regardless of where we are. And we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior. Amen. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending here in the sanctuary and at home. I greatly appreciate it. I know God greatly appreciates it. And at this time, those of you on Zoom can uh, unmute and let's chat. Have a wonderful and blessed day. Hey, Mom. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, Patrick. How are you today? Not a pain. I'm just fine. Good, good, good. Get some go to you, Nancy, here. Oh, and Nancy's uh, there. Well, tell her we send our love to her. Oh, yeah, our love is definitely with her and you, Patrick, and with all of you, too. Passing on a lot of hellos from the congregation to Nancy, Patrick. Sir, Hi. what did you say? Hi, Patty. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Roger. <laughs> Richard, when you did your little bit in the uh, call to worship, I think you have a, a, a career. If your current career ever goes bust, you're, I think you got a new career as a used sales carsman. <laughs> <laughs> I buy a great, you, Richard. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> For some reason we can't hear him, but <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe he got the message. I don't know. <laughs> I don't I know connected. why we can't hear you, Richard, but <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Is this yeah. better? Yeah. yeah. We uh, our connection wasn't strong, but we moved the MiFi much closer. It's much better. So someone was saying something to me, and I just heard it, and that was it. Oh, I said if your current career ever goes bust, I think you've got a second career as a used car salesman. <laughs> and then, and then Roger said I, he would buy from you. <laughs> 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 did you like the little line i added about uh, just like raymond everybody will love you yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah like yes exactly <laughs> i did i edited the script i i embellished <laughs> oh it was great <laughs> Hi, hello lila. lila hi there good morning lila good morning patrick good morning, good morning patrick. Patrick. Is she making progress? Oh, yes, she did. She's okay. still doing good. Good. So, Patrick, I don't know if you heard me before, but uh, a lot of people, when you said that Nancy was there with you, a lot of people in the congregation were saying hello to Nancy and and uh, passing on love from the from this room. Okay. Yeah, she's not here with me. I'm. She's at Twin Pines North. I'm going to okay. go here as soon as I get out of here. Gotcha. Okay, we'll pass on the love from this room, if you would. Yeah. She loves you guys. Mm. So do I. Mm. Love you too. <laughs> all right. Well, I think I'm going to go. So you well, all take care. I'm going to sign off this thing myself, so I'll see you all next week. Okay. All right. Y'all have a really good week. And there's the birthday girl behind us. Happy birthday, Carol. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Bruce, thanks for the card from you and Lila. <laughs> How you doing, Carol?
fine, Patrick. How are you? I'm just fine. Well, Better than I deserve to be. I doubt that. Are you, <laughs> are you still working? Yeah. I'm going to. I've got almost nine months to go. I'm going to retire on my 90th birthday. Oh, my, oh my God. <laughs> what is the punishment? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's so funny. God bless you, Patrick. <laughs> I retired at 64, and I'm enough. never going back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Without God's blessings, I, could, I, I wouldn't still be here. <laughs> all right take I'll care see you all next week bye-bye right. bye-bye